So today I'm going to cover a topic called speech production mechanism. When you talk about the speech production mechanism, it's a specific thing that you have to talk about in a specific way referring to specific parts of the speech anatomy. When we, you talk about speech production mechanism, there is a step-by-step -step process in which you need to take this. What is a speech? It's basically a bunch of sound signals that are associated with ideas, right? Instead of using sound signals, we could use other signals. So I could use my hands or I could use like a sign which is prepared and I can show it to you. Or we could use fire or smoke to signal things. But in order to know what the meaning of that symbol or signal is, you need to already know what that signal is associated with. We need to agree, we need to make a convention that this signal is referring to this idea. But what the signal is could be different. Like if you are part of the deaf community, you don't have access to speech sounds, but you can still have access to language because you can use your uh, hands to make the signals. But obviously, in um, mainstream communication, instead of using gestures, the primary signals are used by making sounds. So, because it takes less energy, and also you can free your hands and you can do other stuff with your hand. So basically, you could be cooking food in the kitchen and still be talking. Obviously, we can use body language in the sense that um, your body language could give more context to your speech and you could also use facial expressions. They're just contextual features. They give more context to speech sound and the primary signals are speech-based or sound-based. Before we start to delve into this topic, it's very important to look at the fundamental structure of linguistic communication in the sense that it is primarily speech-based and speech is basically a bunch of different sounds that we make and we can combine them in different ways to create different signals. So we can all make the sound t and then a and then p but you can say you can say tap or pat and they would mean different things. But if you want to use two of them you can create at and if you just look at it purely phonetically, you can create the word app. When you think of app, you don't think of app, you think of the sequence as one unit, which refers to a one idea. So the order in which you combine them become units by themselves that you refer to different ideas. So this video is about the very mechanism by which we produce the sounds, so which you call speech sounds because they are sounds that are part of speech we can make sounds which are not part of speech. For example, I can make a click, which in English is not part of the speech sounds. There are languages in which those sounds are part of the speech sounds. So if there is like a big set of sounds that we are anatomically capable of producing, every language seems to have a subset of those sounds that it uses for its phonological system. Now, regardless of what specific sounds we talk about, the speech production mechanism in all languages is the same. This is not a language-specific process, it's a language-universal process. In the story of language, that now we have this mechanism that all languages use to produce sounds with which they can communicate ideas. Phonetics is part of an amazing system. So when you do phonetics, you don't have to detach yourself from whatever it is that language does. Think of phonetics as part of a, a bigger system, which is so interesting. I understand phonetics as part of understanding the whole system. So now we are coming to the point at which we want to understand what is the nature of sounds in the first place? Where do they come from? To produce sounds, you need more than move your tongue and lips. Sounds are made mostly by pushing air out of your lungs and then modifying that air before it gets out. So there are other ways in which we can produce sounds, but those are harder. For example, one way with which you can make sounds is 
to breathe air in rather than out. For example, I can say, or I can say, but it takes more energy. It's more difficult. The, the easiest one is just to push air out. So during speech, air comes out of the lungs and travels through the trachea or the windpipe into the larynx. So it passes through between two small muscular folds called the vocal folds or the vocal cords in your voice box. Those vocal folds can have different positions. They can either be tightened, touching each other, or they can be held apart. If they are held apart, the air can pass easily through them. If they are tight, held tight together, when air pushes through, it vibrates them. This is where actual speech starts. Obviously, when the air comes out of your lungs and through the windpipe, there are no options. Like, there is nothing you can do with your windpipe. You can choose to push air out, breathe out, but that's the only thing you can do with your lungs and with the windpipe or trachea. But when it comes to your larynx and the vocal folds, you have a binary choice. You can choose to hold them close together or you can choose to hold them apart. If you hold them close together, because the air is coming out regardless, it will push its way through the vocal folds and by doing so, it will vibrate the vocal folds. And this will result in the ultimate sound being having a feature which we call voiced. As you see in the consonant chart, for example, by labial plosives, you have a set of, you have a pair of sounds, pa and ba. The difference between pa and ba is that in the production of ba, the vocal folds are held tightly together and the passage of air between them makes them vibrate. If you hold them apart, you will have pa. If you keep them tight together and let them be vibrated by the air, then you're producing ba. Voicing, being voiced or voiceless, is an important feature in a language like English and can create minimal pairs such as bus, buzz, sip, zip, su, zu, thigh, thigh, fan, van. When you start learning English, you need to gain full control over the voicing process so that, first of all, you can distinguish different sounds that you hear. If somebody says bus as opposed to buzz, they are saying two different words. Secondly, when you want to speak those words, you can produce them accurately. So what happens after the vocal folds? After the larynx, the air goes through the pharynx. And then at this point, there is a fork. Now, air passages after and above the larynx are the vocal tract. The vocal tract is the space after larynx. Pharynx, we have the oral tract mouth and pharynx and nasal tract which is the nose so this whole thing is called the vocal tract so this uvula can be raised to block the nasal cavity in which case the sound will be entirely oral or it can be lowered to allow air go through the nasal cavity in which case the sound is nasal now if you look at the nasal sounds here the, the row in which we have the nasal sounds. During the production of all of these sounds, the uvula is lowered and air passes through the nose or the nasal cavity. So what is the difference between the different sounds in this consonant chart? Depending on what options you make along any part of the vocal tract, you will end up producing different sounds. So as I just explained, if you lower your uvula, you're going to have a nasal sound. If you raise it, it will be non-nasal because the nasal cavity is blocked. What else can you do? You can close your lips and still say a sound like mmm. Why is it that if you close your mouth and even your lips and there is no air coming out of your oral cavity, you can still produce the sound mmm continuously. So where does that sound come from? It comes through your nose because it's a nasal sound and it's bilabial, it means both lips, both lips touch. So now, so along the, the oral cavity, you have different parts of the mouth that can engage in the production of sounds. For example, you have your alveolar ridge, your heart palate. So this is the upper part of the mouth. The lower part of the mouth, which is your lower lip, lower teeth, 
and the different parts of the tongue, they can also engage in the production of sounds. So all of these, the lower ones and the upper ones are called articulators. Parts of the vocal tract that can be used to form sounds are called articulators. Not just in the mouth, anywhere. Articulators are divided into two groups. They are either passive or active. An active articulator is an articulator that can move. For example, the tongue is an active articulator because it can move. But the upper part of your mouth, for example, the heart palate or the alveolar ridge, is a passive articulator because it cannot move. If you look at the consonant here in the chart, you have these alveolar sounds. So these terms like alveolar, palatal, they, use, they refer to the passive articulator. So, for example, in the production of alveolar sounds, the tongue, as the active articulator, moves towards the alveolar ridge and it kind of touches it, sometimes it approaches it, and it produces an alveolar sound. In other words, an alveolar sound, to be precise, is a lingo-alveolar sound, but typically we just use the passive articulator to name the sound. You need to know that even though you call it alveolar, there's two articulators in the production of the sound. You see, all of these could be lingual. Lingodental, lingoalveolar, lingopostalveolar, lingoretroflase, lingopalatal. In the case of the tongue, we just don't mention it. But if there is something else, we mention it. For example, in the case of labiodental, we mention that although it is dental, but it's not lingodental, it's labiodental. And in the case of bilabial, we clarify that it's two lips. Interestingly, the tongue is the most versatile, the most flexible speech organ available to us. Back to the title of the video. When you have these sounds, and I want to ask you, can you explain to me the speech production mechanism for the sound T? For the voiceless alveolar plosive or can you explain to me the voiced alveolar plosive da? you have to clarify four things so the speech production mechanism has four processes what is the first process the first process is called the airstream process how air is pushed out or sucked in to provide power for speech primarily are you pushing air out or are you sucking air in for every sound, you have to clarify the airstream process. After you clarify that, the st second step is you have to explain the phonation process. What is the phonation process? It's the voicing process, the vocal folds. Are the vocal folds tightened to vibrate or are they held apart? In the first case, it would be voiced. In the second case, it would be voiceless. So, for example, the airstream process for the sound D is you're pushing air out of your lungs. The phonation process is you're holding your vocal folds tight and they vibrate because it is a voice sound. What is the third process? Air stream going out through the mouth or going out through the nose? In other words, is the uvula raised to block the nasal cavity or is it lowered? Is it a nasal sound? For example, in the case of D, it is not a nasal sound. Therefore, you have to clarify that the uvula is raised and the nasal cavity or the nasal tract is blocked because this is an oral sound. It is not a nasal sound. The fourth and last step is tongue and lips interacting with the roof of the mouth. For example, in the case of D, the tongue is raised to touch the alveolar ridge because the sound is an alveolar sound. 